You're listening to The Professional Podcast, hosted by the Blue Collar Consulting Group. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to yet another episode of The Professional Podcast. This is your host, Gary Roth. I wanted to come on before the actual show and just kind of set this up. Uh, the guy that we're going to talk to, Travis Jacobs, he's an engineer. Him and I hooked up on LinkedIn and exchanged some really cool ideas. And so if this is your first time to the show, please bear with me. It takes us a little bit to get going. I think Travis was just a tad bit nervous. That's not to insult him at all. I don't know if he does a lot of podcasts or not. But once we got rolling, man, this guy is incredibly smart. You know, grab a piece of paper. You're going to want to grab, uh, you know, some of his thoughts on leadership, communication and innovation and it, this is not just for like an engineering firm or for Boeing or for the Department of Defense this is for everyday life if you manage one person or a thousand people these uh, messages can come into play perhaps you're being managed by someone that could use this advice I mean there are a lot of ways this can be applied and I am a massive student of leadership I love leadership I love leading I love being led properly so this podcast episode is awesome for a lot of reasons and if you like i say if you're not in a leadership position if you are in a position where you are being led or managed by someone find a way to kind of slide this into their social media feed or maybe slide this episode in their email because the leadership lessons that are discussed in this episode will make your life better. And if you are a leader, it will make your life better and the lives of your team so much better. Oh, and stick around because he talks about how to better disseminate ideas and solve problems. It's a really awesome way to prioritize, uh, split up and group up, man. It is awesome stuff. So stick around, quick ad break, and we'll get right into the show. Thanks for tuning in. Talk to you soon. You're listening to The Professional Podcast, the best self-improvement podcast on the planet. You're listening to The Professional Podcast with Gary Roth. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Professional Podcast. I'm your host, Gary Roth, founder of the Blue Collar Consulting Group. With us today is a very special guest by the name of Travis Jacobs. Now, some of my previous shows, I've had some authors and some speakers and you know, folks that have, you know, titles and all this other stuff. But Travis is actually really unique in the fact that him and I connected over LinkedIn. Uh, he mentioned that he liked some of my thoughts and material and we traded a few messages and he has really interesting uh, perspectives on innovation and leadership. He has a really uh, impressive resume. He's been an engineer for at least 15 years that I know of, probably more than that. Uh, he is an engineer. He's a very interesting guy. Travis, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Gary. Pleasure to be here. I'm glad. I'm really glad for that. So one of the big angles that we discussed first was the lack of leadership and in innovation. And so you have some background on some pretty big uh, companies that work in like the defense industry and stuff like that. Today, what, what do you, how does leadership play a role in innovation? Talk to me about some of those stories we shared on our, uh, on our pre-call. Yeah, in uh, in my opinion, my experience, uh, leadership and innovation, I believe, are, are tied together. You know, th think of them as uh, you know brothers holding hands, or you know brothers sisters, kind of. They're, they're they're very closely related, and I always say you can't really have one without the other. Sure, and absolutely right, because. You know, I, I think that there's a role for all of us to play. Leaders leaders lead and developers develop, engineers engineer. Um, Absolutely. You know, so how, how does a leader, in, in your opinion, or, you know, or maybe how does a leader fail in innovation? How does a leader improve innovation? What are your thoughts on that? What what role does the leader play? Uh, I, I would say that they have a big role. Uh, one thing that I see is, um, that the biggest failure points, I call it, uh, you know, do as I say, just follow the process, mm -hmm. my way of the highway. Yeah. And that, that's a big, that's a big, that's a big one. So what would be the solution to that? Uh, I would call that, <clears throat> and I believe, I believe we, uh, we talked about this before, 
you know, I, I think it comes from the, from the army and the military, you know, decentralized command. Okay. Yeah. Expand you on know, that, you, that decentralized command. That's a good word. So, uh, so I would, I would call it, you know, you have to, you have to let the, the guys on the front lines, the troops in the ditches, you know, kind of take ownership of, of the problem. Okay. And, and that's kind of a, a big catchy buzzword these days of you have to empower your people. You have to give them ownership. Sure. And 99 times out of a hundred, when a leader says that to me in projects that I've worked on, it's just lip service. Oh, okay. Let's, let's talk it, about it, that. It's, uh, I, I don't know if why or how, or, you know, if it's ego or if it's, they don't really know how to do that. But usually when, when a leader says, take ownership of this and everything goes wrong, the first person they blame is you. Right. So that's, that's kind of a big, that's kind of a big one of, you, you want me to take ownership. You want me to be in charge. But the second I make a mistake, the second I do something that you don't like, you crucify me. Yeah, that's a very challenging situation to be in. Um, and that's I, very challenging. Yeah, and I kind of hear you saying, uh, Travis, that you know, oppressive leadership or you know, just bad leadership could really stifle innovation. Absolutely. Yeah, dictatorships don't really work. Yeah. So, I guess the biggest thing is, from from your perspective, I'm going a little bit a little bit in the left field here then uh, how, how does a leader balance you know leadership and progress and obviously innovation is a big part of that how, how would a good leader handle mistakes is it like you get the first one free the second one we're going to clamp down on you the third one we're out of here or is or is there really no set pattern to to do it right um that that's not you know Baseball rules, as I call them, three strikes and you're out. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's a it's a it's that, a template that, for sure. Yeah, I mean that that's not an entirely bad way to go about it. the The only thing you have to do is, you know, going back to decentralized command, you have to make sure that a they understand, uh -huh. you know, where are we going and why are we going there. Okay, you know, so what, really the first the, step in that good leadership and innovation thing is to provide clear direction, but not in a dictatorial kind of way, dictatorial, whatever kind of way, just provide Absolutely. a vision. Is that kind of what you're saying? A vision. Yeah. You'd call it a vision. I call it um, a compass, not a map. Okay. Hey, nice. Ooh. Yeah. Compass, not a map. I like that. You know, it's like a, a, a very easy example is okay. We're, we're standing in San Diego. We want to go to Seattle. Right. So Seattle's the destination. So head north. Head north, my friend. Head north. Okay. So the first step, so, right that like, direction and, and vision. It's it's a compass, not a map. Yep. And then I guess really the only time you'd really start to jump in is if they start heading towards Colorado, right? Absolutely. But or, it, so then or, you have to define the limits of how okay. far off can they go before you jump in and, and, you know, crucify them. But before they even start on their journey, you have to make sure they understand we're going to Seattle, we're going to Seattle and not just say, we're going to Seattle, make it happen. Sure. Well, why are we going to Seattle? Okay. What's in it for me? Yeah. You know, what, what's, yeah. what's the, the benefit? Them. They call that the whiff them. What's in it for me? Yeah, exactly. You know, what's in it for me? What's in it for the team? What's in it for the organization? You know, how does how does my success, how does me getting to Seattle help the team, help me, help the company? You know, the yeah. why of why why are we going to Seattle? It's like I don't want to go to Seattle. I'm perfectly happy right here. Why should why should I <laughs> Exactly. I'm perfectly happy right here. So Travis, I, so I have to ask you, man, uh, you have some background and kind of like, I mean, you, you get the military, you understand the defense structure. There are times when it's like, do it now, just, just do it now. Like if you're under fire, 
and you need freaking your squad to move into that building. You don't tell them why. You just go, get going. I'll explain the why later. But those situations, in my opinion, Travis, are very few and far between. And yet, leaders today, even in 2020, why are they so resistant to explain the why to their subordinates? Is it because they truly don't know? Or is there an arrogance in the position of leadership that they carry? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I think it, it probably has to do with both. Okay. Um, you know, there's there's definitely a uh, component of ego. Sure. And especially in like engineering organizations, because um, I've had this happen many times. You know, when I was kind of young and dumb and I didn't know better. Okay. <laughs> I would ask my boss, "Why are we doing this? If we do it like this, we can do it better." You know why? And and they got mad at me. And I think part of the reason was ego, and part of the reason was they didn't know. Sure. And I think the probably the underlying reason was they couldn't admit, I don't know. Right. Well, and I some think of them, the, some of them did. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's good. Like, look, I just don't know. And I think that there's, there's so much to leadership that relies on trust and respect and really you can kind of form that into re- the word relationship, you know, a, a good solid relationship. But you and I both know if you, if you stress the relationship too much with the just do it, I don't know. And things like that, it's going to erode very quickly. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. If, if you don't have trust and respect, then you're not going to get very far. Trust and respect is, is absolutely, man, absolutely right. So here, here's kind of a zinger for you, Travis, you know, sometimes mistakes turn into unintended positive consequences. Uh, right now I'm thinking of, you know, post-it notes. Okay. Yep. Um, I think WD 40 has some stories of that. Is there, Teflon. what's that? Teflon. Yeah. Tef- there Teflon you go. The same way. So, you know, at some point, does, does it take just a, a, a once in a lifetime creative genius to see that? Or can you, can you train people on how to be open for these unintended positive consequences? Is it a culture thing? What do you, what do you think? I think it has to do with culture. I think it's definitely a cultural thing. Look at 3M, the innovation at 3M. Uh, leadership definitely plays a role in that. Okay. And it kind of goes back to the to the whole decentralized command you know, or commander's intent of where are we going and why are we going there. Yeah. Yeah. Commander's and, and intent you kinda is have, huge. Oh, it's <clears throat> when when I first discovered that it's like, man, if engineering teams could just do this one thing, their their batting average would double. I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it one bit. Because and let let's step into your world for a little bit. How much is it? it how much of your work is hypothesis versus, you know, learning from failure? You know, the the trial and error. Uh, there's there's a lot of trial and error there's a lot of hypothesis sure kind of depends upon you know like big organizations versus kind of small teams like startups Uh uh you know take boeing for example boeing has a very 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 strict process really you should do this you should do this you should do this and and there's there's very little leeway to, to Interesting. Even on process. their like research and their R and D, their research and development teams. Uh, the the R and D teams are a little different. Okay, I I don't um, know. I'm I'm, you know, purely speculating. Yeah. The, the, well, <clears throat> it it's a little kind of a little different. You got like R and D teams, like for example, one of the projects mm-hmm. I worked on years ago was a Boeing project, Future Combat Systems. Okay. So that that was kind of an an R and D kind of proof of concept. Okay. Huge, huge, huge failure. Whereas if you look at like the 747 or the 737 or the Dreamliner, those are kind of more well defined. So it's okay. We're going to take four years. We're going to develop this product. We're going to go from here to here. I see. So that's really interesting. So it's almost as if their creativity 
is being shuffled into one department instead of allowing for possible innovation across the field by saying we have the strict process, we don't deviate from it, this is it, or get out. Do you think that that kind of limits their ability to innovate and try new things? Uh, I I would say that that kind of suffocates and strangles their ability yeah. to innovate and try new things. <laughs> suffocates and strangles. It kind of goes back to – uh, something that I'm a big fan of, customer service should never be a department. Your customer service should be a culture. And yep. so uh, it kind of sounds like Boeing is kind of doing the opposite of that. Instead of allowing for innovation to come from anywhere, they only want it in one small section of the company. That's 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 probably uh, well said. Yeah. You know, the, I, I don't know if... Boeing specifically has like R and D departments. Yeah. You know, I know they have, they do R and D maybe a little different. Sure. Sure. Then like, you know, a, a small, the medium sized business, mm-hmm. but yeah, the, the bureaucracy, red tape, excessive process, just do it. Yeah. Well, and because I think I that really, so. bleed, I think that really flows into what we spoke about, Um, in our kind of our warm up call was that, you know, when you look at a process that's clearly defined, I'm sure that can have some certain benefits. When you look at companies that don't have decentralized leadership, uh, you and I spoke about those communication problems and how that really affects the ability to make a decision. So if you can't communicate, how can you make any kind of decision? Yeah. It's the my way or the highway or because I said so. Yeah. I, I, to- you know, one of the things that makes the United States Army great is the ability that we have to empower our junior leaders, right? We, we mm-hmm. you, As you well know, we use this thing called mission command, commander's intent, mission orders, and then you guys go figure it out with within this intent. Why do you think companies are so afraid to empower? And let's be honest, you, you said it perfectly earlier. A lot of it is lip service. Why are yeah. companies so hesitant to truly empower the folks in the field? Why, why is that? I, I think part of it stems from you know, the way we've always done it. Okay. Habit. Is <clears throat> habit, culture. Yeah. You know, there, there's, there's a few different words for it. You know, part of it is, is kind of just this is how we've done it, so – a, we don't know how, so that there's a bit of an ego piece in there of, well, I have okay. to admit that I don't know how. And then B, I think it's part of our education and training in high school, college. Oh, okay. Interesting. You know, I, I that's kind of my opinion. I'm sure other people have different perspectives, but it'd be sure. interesting to get other people's take on that of, you know, yeah, I, I, think I that, haven't. That, go ahead. I'm sorry. The the only that the reason why we're talking is this idea of decentralized command, commander's intent comes from the military. Yeah, I've never heard anybody in business or in business school talk about this. That's it's very interesting. Uh, I mean, hierarchy yeah, top down. Yeah, absolutely. And what you say is it's it's all about leadership. We empower our people. That's our. That's a CEO giving a thirty-second speech about it, not actually doing it. <laughs> Sounds like a Delbert cartoon. It, you know, it really does. You know, with the guy in the tie and the glasses, it, it's, it's <laughs> a very, very accurate thing. But you know, that's so interesting, Travis, that you mentioned that because, like, the public school system. I went to public school. Did you go to public school as well? I did. Um. You know, we were we were taught information. You know, we weren't really taught ideals, which I'm thankful for because I didn't want somebody else's values being pressed upon me in oh, public absolutely. school. I think public school should be there for information only. Uh, I mean, there's sure, of course, there's some common values that can be taught. Don't steal. Treat people with respect. Like I'm, I'm tracking all that. Yeah. But um, you know, you and I, we see things differently. Like we kind of step out of the machine and see the gears working, right? So yeah. I, do you think that early education could could spur more innovation? Or is it something that we just kind of have to wait and see who pops up? 
Well, I think I think early education could, you know, teach people how to think, not what to think. Ooh, very interesting. <laughs> also, I mean, uh, so, some people are just better at this than others. Okay. But I some think we could teach it in there. high school. We could teach it college. We kind of we kind of use a technique and we teach classes and workshops in this and we call it the six thinking hats and each each hat has a different color and okay. a different function so there's there's six of them and it started from a book uh concept from edward de bono the hat with a name by the same title and we use the it's called the green thinking hat mm -hmm. so green is you know the color of grass okay so it's creativity, it's ingenuity, it's, hey, how do we solve this problem? What do you think? So we use it in a team environment, and we say, okay, everybody put on your green thinking hat. Let's go. Huh. And, you, and you just start rapid firing ideas of, okay, what about this? What about this? So I think creativity – you know, I don't think creativity like athletic ability, you either have it or you don't. Okay. I, I think it, it can be learned. It can sure. be trained, just like training for a marathon or lifting weights. Right. You, you may not be a bodybuilder and be able to lift 600 pounds, but you can get better. You can get stronger. Yeah. Yeah, everybody has the ability to improve to some degree. It's Absolutely. I think what separates us and to some degree is that, that natural talent. That's a very good point. So and, go ahead. So, so talking with um, other companies, other clients, some of my friends, and I said, hey, have you tried this? You know, have you tried the thinking hats? And they said, yeah, we can't do that. Well, that's interesting. Why, why can't you do that? Yeah. Because if, if we propose an idea that the boss, you know, has a habit of shooting the messenger, so there's yeah. this culture of fear, of, you know, don't rock the boat. Don't say anything that'll offend the boss's ego or anybody else's ego. So everybody keeps their mouth shut out of fear because they don't want to get in trouble or right, right. I know, think that's and respect. Yeah, that's that's so sad because you know it. Two things: number one, there there's so much fragile egos in those scenarios. You know oh, the. You know what I mean? Like the boss doesn't want to hear anything different, right? And then like the yeah. worker too, like, oh, I need this job. I can't get it. That's fragile self-esteem as well. And yeah. I think that if people were more confident, especially today, I mean, let, let's be honest. I'll be honest with you, Travis. When you tell somebody something, you don't tell one person. You tell 10,000 if you're connected on social media. And so, yeah. you know – if somebody is talented and they are wronged at their company, then they have a very loud voice that I don't think they truly appreciate. At the same time, the CEO on the other side shouldn't want bad press. You, I mean, you, it seems so simple to me to show value to everybody that works for you, to, to you know, not empower them in this particular conversation, but to, to make them feel valued by making them feel heard. It, it seems yeah, to me absolutely. like a very simple thing to do. Yeah, we, we along with the uh, the six thinking hats, um, we we use another kind of tool. Very simple, uh, very easy. Some people might say it's you know a little childish, but uh, <clears throat> it comes out of the Native American Indians. Okay. Uh, the talking stick. Oh yeah. So we use we don't use a stick. Because I know engineers, and if you give engineers a stick, they're going to start hitting each other with it. <laughs> right. We need more sticks in here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like that. That, that could go. That could go off the rails in a hurry. So we, we use just a little, uh, a little football. We call it the talking football. I got it. They use that so, in uh, group therapy and marriage therapy as well. Yeah. So so it's sim simple idea. If you're not if you're not holding the football, then you're supposed to listen to the other person. 
so the the purpose of that is to what you just said give everybody a voice have everybody's voice heard yeah i just i wish and you know even if you don't formalize it with a physical object but just to you know our reaction to ideas as leaders and subordinates is is crucial and i'm sure you're well aware of this oh, because it only takes two or three that's dumb we're not doing that it only takes two or three times for that me personally to, and that's it i'm not bringing you anything else for this problem because you don't yep. want to hear me um and and i Absolutely. just feel, yeah i feel strongly there might even be people travis that one time that's it right and then how much creativity are, you know you're you're damming up a river and letting nothing come through and yep. it's just, it's not going to work for you. It's going to dry everything up. So what happens in that situation, even one time, your team's going to say, okay, smart guy, you're the leader. You know everything. Yep. I'm just going to sit here and tell you, tell me what to do, how to do it, and when to do it. Yeah, totally agree. Like, I'm going to be a machine now. I'm going to be a lever that you have to pull. And so what happens is, if you have four or five people on your team and you're the leader, you can probably micromanage and control, you know, four to six people on a daily basis. I, I think that's Unless probably accurate crisis. depending on the work. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and if you're in total crisis mode, that, that may change a little bit, but you know, day-to-day -day operations, you know, you've got six people working for you. You, you could probably make that work for a while. Right. But what happens is if you have 30 people working for you oh, yeah. or everything's going wrong, you know, products failing, this is, you know, crisis and chaos, you, you just, you just lost all ability to do anything. Yeah. You're right about that. And that's, I, I mean, that's, sure that's true. That. That's so true. Um, yeah, man, that's a really good point. Just, just the stifling of that. Okay. So now let's kind of, let's kind of, uh, let's take another look at this. All right. So empowering your people, hearing the good ideas, all very good, all very good. At the same time, we know too much of a good thing is a bad thing. How do you, you know, how would you suggest, like, let's say you get a flood of good ideas. Is how do you know which one to pick? Is that when the relationships kick in? Is that where trust or experience kicks in? <sighs> Oh, yes, what, do you, what do you do when you have a flood of good ideas? Can you can you speak to that? So um, kind of how we do it, and I've seen other people do this and it works well. It's like, you know, going back to the thinking hats, like, okay, put on your green thinking hat. Let's start putting out ideas. Okay. So say you have six people. Everybody comes up with, say, 20 or 30 ideas. Oh, wow. Okay. Per person. Yeah. So, you know, that's that's almost 200 ideas. You obviously can never execute on 200 ideas. No, no, of course so, not. So then you say, and this is kind of one, one little tactic that I use, like, okay, we have 200 ideas. Everybody, I want you to prioritize these ideas into three. Uh, okay, there it is, prioritize. You know, you can call it good, bad, ugly, high, medium, low, one, two, three, ABC, whatever you want. You know, A, A is, is the best. B is in the middle, and then C is at the bottom. Okay, sure. So so whatever you've got, so you got 200 ideas. It's like, okay, split that into three buckets evenly. Right. A, B, C. So then you just take a pen or a Sharpie and, okay, A, B, C, you know, two minutes and just everybody doom, 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 down the okay. list. Sure. Then what you do is is you take all the A's and you put them in one bucket and you throw out the other two thirds. Okay. Okay. So right off the bat, you just, you've just eliminated two thirds of the options. Gotcha. So that way you can, at that point, discuss, hammer out, the, whatever the, the best ideas from the team. Yeah. Prioritize and execute. Prioritize and execute. That is an absolutely, man, that's, that's a good way to do it. That's a good way to do it. And then I guess you trust your team at that point to work on the ideas together and, and truly pursue the, the top one or two, whatever the, the case may call for. Um, Absolutely. And then that's awesome. you can even do it again. You know, if you've got, say you've got 
30 good ideas after the, after you do uh-huh. that. It's like, okay, well, let's do it again. ABC. Right. Until you get down to three to five, maybe six at the most, potential solutions. Right. And then right, you say, right. okay, so I've got, I've got five. Then you, then you prioritize again. I want you to number them one through five. And then I, I want you to do them in order that you would execute. So we're going to do one first, two second. Uh-huh. So then, okay, here, here's, here's the number one idea. We're going to go execute on that idea. And if things change, we're going to come back to the list. Maybe we pick two. Maybe we do it again. You know, kind of like, like the OODA loop. Yeah. So the process is secure, but it provides a safe environment for the flow of, of innovation and ideas. Yep. Hmm. That's really so interesting. Ev- everybody has their say. Yeah. Everybody gets to, you know, yeah. input in. Well, and wouldn't and- that be... And that would really improve speed because if if A fails miserably, boom, you can go right back and go back and get number two and start executing on that, right? There you go. You have you have a built in kind of contingency plan of here's yes. our primary plan, here's our secondary plan, here's our tertiary plan. If A doesn't right. work, we're gonna go to B. Or we can you know, look at it and say, Well Yeah. No, I think that's great, Travis. It's almost like football, like your two-minute drill, like when you're doing the hurry-up offense. When you start, yeah. you're, you're calling three plays in advance before you even snap the football. Calling then, an audible from the line of scrimmage because the defense has read your play. It's like, okay, yeah. guys, we're, 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 not, we're not running. We're passing because the defense exactly. has got our number or, you know, if they're blitzing or sure. exactly. No, that's 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 an absolutely solid thing. So just if you're listening to this as a listener, when you brainstorm ideas to attack a project, a problem, a technique, whatever you're doing, you know, have everybody brainstorm, let everybody innovate, let everybody try, then have them prioritize their ideas, go and discuss everybody's top tier ideas, you know, hash out which direction you're going to go and then and then categorize or rank order of merit list for us army people order of merit the rest of them so that if the first plan doesn't work out it doesn't perform as well you already have a backup plan you have another approach ready to go but you've got to formalize that up front just like in football two minute drill you're calling your next two or three plays before you snap the ball and then just like what travis said you have your audibles always ready to go so that you can keep adjusting based on what you see out there Travis can probably yeah, agree absolutely. that oh, absolutely. Um, the, the first, <laughs> uh, a good plan never survives first contact. That's one of my favorite quotes. Yeah, that's a good one. The other, right. the other right. thing that's, that's really good, um, or this process can break down. If you have 30 people in a room, it doesn't really work. Yeah, you you need to kind of break it into squads and teams like the Marine sure. Corps. Yeah, Army does, teams, you know, like, yeah, then your teams could bring their best ideas. Yeah, yeah, you have a a fire team or a squad of four to six people. So you have three to four teams. It's like okay, exactly. split into groups of four. Yeah. So you have sixteen people, and then then you can do this as you know four people, and then you say, okay, we got four teams. Everybody come with one idea. So now you have four ideas, and right. then you can kind of, hey, are these, do we pursue all four, or any of these ideas similar? You yeah. know, it's kind of like, and in that case, it's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like the combined arms dilemma, yeah? Yeah, no, that, that's, Travis, that, that's beautiful, because you could even empower the teams to go implement their own ideas. Uh-huh. And then you could so, shift fire based on success. Like, let's say team A does really good and they're getting this performance, whatever. Well, team Bravo and Charlie, they're not doing so good. So you could say, all right, Bravo, Charlie, you're going to roll into alpha and help them proliferate this idea even further. Absolutely. So that battlefield commander can really pour it on where they're getting 
the most progress. And see, this is the interesting thing that, you know, I love about the military, which I don't understand about business. Business says that's inefficient. That's redundant. We can't do it that way because we got four teams trying to solve the same problem. But in the Army or the Marine Corps, it's we got four teams trying to solve the same problem, but they're all attacking it from different angles. So we have a much higher probability of success. Exactly. You know, aviation is doing their thing. Artillery is doing their thing. It's, it's empowering the folks to do, to solve a problem with their strengths. I mean, obviously you don't ask an infantry guy to fly a helicopter. You don't ask a pilot to shoot artillery. So it goes back to what you said, truly empowering number one is, and this is something we learn in resiliency training is recognizing the strengths in others and then putting them, uh, Harvard business review, uh, wrote a book that on management or the 20 best articles on management. Uh, one of them was like, uh, managing yourself. And so it's like putting yourself in a position to succeed based on your strengths, not on what you're okay at, not on what you're meh at, but like what you're good at. And then focus Absolutely. on that. When you have the luxury of many people, guess what? You have a lot of people that can do a lot of different things really well, and you don't have to force people into these different roles. Yeah, Peter Drucker always said, mm. you organize That's what it is. Your That's the name. Thank you. You organize your strengths to make your weaknesses irrelevant. Yeah. You it's, know, it's and I think kind of been, a take on combined arms. Yeah, exactly. And it's just like, you know, you hire your weaknesses. You know what I mean? Absolutely. One, I, I forget who said it. It might have been Einstein. But he says, uh, we don't teach fish to climb trees. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah e exactly right. I mean, that's just, that's just human nature. But we just, we think that we have in our culture backwards that everybody, and part of it is like that movement, that positive psychology movement of the late 70s and the 80s that, you can have anything you want. You can be anything you want to be. And to some degree, that's true. And I can understand the the premise behind it, empowering folks to not be beat down, to explore things. However, comma, you are only going to be good, really good at a few things. It's on us to find out what those things are. We're designed a certain way. I fully believe that. And then, you know, it's on you to use hard work to bring out your best. Uh, here, here's something I've realized. You know, you can call it the dichotomy of human nature. People are usually aware of what they're really good at. Okay. Like for me, for example, I'm I'm not really aware of all of my weaknesses. But if you if you ask, you know, the guy standing next to you that you've been working with for six months, it's like. In 30 seconds, he can probably tell you what you're bad at. Hey, man, what, what am I bad at? What are my weaknesses? <laughs> right, right, right. You can't say it, but he can. Sure. And, wow, that's that's a really powerful point. Um, we, we need that outside uh, assessment from time to time. Uh, it, it can be a little tricky, though, because uh, sometimes when we get that criticism, it, it bruises our ego. Well, and that's, and let's be honest, that, that takes a special person because it's a person that is truly desiring self-improvement. I'm one of those people. I love self-improving. I like to learn new things. My, I like to keep my brain flexible, much as I'm sure you do as well. Mm -hmm. But when I receive criticism, I'm, a, I'm not a little weird, I guess. I'm a little, I'm specific. I don't want criticism from somebody that I don't think is above me in abilities. Does that make sense? Like if somebody's going to correct me in the military, I I don't want correction from an E4 specialist, right? I want correction from a sergeant major. I mean, <laughs> so I but at the same time, when sergeant major speaks to me, I'm I'm 100% locked in, all in, humble, uh, flexible to change, right? So yeah. I guess it all depends on the approach and the relationship you have with that particular person. Absolutely. But here's kind of the, the funny thing is you don't really, you know, it, it would kind of be like me telling Tom Brady how to throw a football. 
hey, hey man, that, that was a really good game against the Dolphins. Here's what you screwed up on. He's going to look at <laughs> right, me uh-oh. like, who are you? Yeah, who are you again? It's, it's every who, armchair who quarterback in the United States. Absolutely. So if, if you're not – like if you're not at the same level yep. as the person you're giving or if they perceive you're not at the same level. That's it. If they don't perceive it, right. So I'm sure Tom Brady would take advice from his team or Belichick or maybe other quarterbacks. I, I don't really know, but he's not going to take advice from me because I know nothing about football. <laughs> well, and that's just it because he has coaches around him that that can give an objective assessment and that's what they're there for that's why they're hired they've earned that position and so typically the the quarterback will trust those people and i think it takes a certain degree of humility on our part too like why am i giving you this advice uh-huh. why do i want you to have this advice and i think leadership is the same way you know, and it, it, we're, we're doing a full circle here, Travis, because you've got to tell the people why. If you see a bum on the street and you say, get a job, okay, that is absolutely useless. First of all, it yeah. shows your, your hardened heart. You know, I mean, it shows your lack of empathy and probably lack of understanding. We don't know what happened to this person. You know, he could be mentally, we, you know, we don't know, right? Yeah. So I think as a leader, when there's correction to be done, you have to set the stage by saying why. Like, this is what we expect out of you, and here's why. Like, we need you to recruit this many people because this is our part of the overall quota or mission, mm-hmm. right? I know that it seems boring for you to play rear guard on this mission. Uh, General Mattis said several years ago in a YouTube video, don't worry, there's going to be plenty of fighting for everybody. When he was talking to the rear guard soldiers, when on the opposite side of the compound, they were engaging the enemy. The folks on the rear mm-hmm. guard, they wanted to go fight. And he's like, hold on, we need you back here because that, that front attack could be a fake for a surprise attack. And so y- y- you just got to explain that. Why, like you said originally, to get that improved performance, to be open to innovation, I mean, that's, that's just the key. Yeah, it's, I, I've realized that I've made a ton of mistakes over the years, and you kind of have to do it with, without a condescending tone. Uh, that, and that can be difficult. Like, that can be difficult. Why, what the hell were you thinking? Why did you do it that way? Right. You know, that, that's – when, when I was younger, it I've, help. I've done it that. It doesn't help. No. And I so I, I'm going to go way off in left field because it's Martin Luther King Day. We've been told for the last 50 years what we've been doing wrong with civil rights and race relations and tensions in this country. I have no idea your ethnicity, and I don't, I don't care. You're an intelligent human being to me, Travis. Um, and so I, I think that um, more than anything, I, I just got to go in a new direction. I think we have to celebrate, massively celebrate, like success. I think we have to massively celebrate and go over the top with folks that are getting along, showing and and providing a pathway for folks to see how valuable diversity is. Instead of always telling us in the media what we're getting wrong, all the problems that we have, but that's just it. You say that's wrong. Okay, now what? You slap me on the hand. Now what? Instead, we need a path to follow. We need a direction to go show me what is right instead of just showing what is wrong in in all of behavioral psychology. If all you focus on is the negative, that's the behavior that you get. But when you focus on positive psychology, positive directions, give examples to follow, guess what? People tend to do the right thing. And so it's just like what you said, Travis, you know, when you're correcting folks, give them the right direction to go. Yeah, tell them what the standard of performance is, the gold standard of yes, you know, kind of the compass of here's <clears throat> here's where we want to go. Yeah, I just it blows my mind. And like kinda, the yeah, one you, one of the things ahead, that I've seen. <laughs> one one of the problems that I've seen. It's like most people understand that, but where where the failure comes in, it's like 
okay, Jack, I want you to run a marathon. We're going to we're gonna go run a marathon tomorrow. So we're going to go run 26.2 miles tomorrow. And Jack's Ooh. like, uh, no, I have no <laughs> yeah, training. Hold on, bud. <laughs> the farthest I've ever ran, you know, was 500 yards, you know, to catch a bus or a train. It's like, yeah, you say that to Jack and he's like, nope. <clears throat> He's not. He's not even going to try because it's so far above yes. what he knows or thinks he can do. Yep, exactly. Rather than saying, "Hey, hey, Jack, tomorrow we're going to go run a mile," and even even if we have to walk, that's fine. We're going to finish we're, we're that gonna, mile. We're going to finish that mile. If, if if we have to crawl, that's fine. So maybe maybe the next day it's like, oh. We're, we're going to run the mile again. Let's see if we can beat our time from yesterday. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of and you're going to the be there every step approach. of the way. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That's real leadership. Real leadership. Travis, listen, I got to tell you, man, this is a perfect time to wrap this up. Let me just let me just say a few points here. You know, our discussion of leadership has never once even remotely approached that it's okay to just boss people around. If you want elevated human performance in your organization, it's going to take a massive effort on the leader's part, on your part if you're a leader, to explain the purpose, give the vision, give the directions. It's a compass, not a map. You've got to be involved. You've got to make steady corrections from a position of improvement, not just arrogance. You've got to stay involved and you've got to know your people, you know, prioritizing ideas, brainstorming. These, these are all aspects of great leadership. Travis, I can't tell you how much I have appreciated uh, this talk. And and man, I mean, I've I've been scrambling down notes here. I mean, I could I could do a 47 blog post just from the stuff we talked about today on leadership. Uh, so I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the show and discussing this kind of stuff. And I'd like to have you back and hone in on even more topics. Um, Absolutely. It's, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for uh, yeah, having me. Yeah, of course. Me. Now, are this is you, one of my favorite you, topics. To yeah, I can about. tell. This is awesome. Now, do you, um, what, do, what do you got going on? I mean, are you on social? Are you writing a book? Are you blogging? What, what? Uh, we're on LinkedIn. Uh, you find me under Travis Jacobs. Okay, Travis Jacobs on LinkedIn. Uh, where we pu publish a blog, it's uh, ja-simulations.com. Okay. So Juliet Alpha simulationscom um, At some point, I, I I'd like to write a book. Uh, I <laughs> just don't have enough. I, <laughs> yeah. I just don't have enough content yet. I've got. Okay. You know, probably a couple hundred pages on my computer of disconnected thoughts and this and sure. that. I just haven't been able oh, to good editor. it categorize. Yeah. I can help I you with that. <laughs> yeah. I am not one of those. Trust me. I probably got as many pages as you of these random thoughts, but anyway, oh. Travis, I will, I, if it's all right with you, I'll put these links in the podcast notes. Folks can connect with you. Uh, maybe it'll open up some more doors for you to discuss your leadership perspectives, which are very, yeah, I've really enjoyed the show. Uh, thanks a lot for coming on and, uh, man, yeah, let's do this again sometime. Absolutely. I'd love to. All right, Travis. I hope you have a good rest of your day, man. Thank you so much. 